of all, I want to thank the organizing committee for having me here today. I also want to thank King Stanley Robinson for actually being here, since I'm going to be talking about your uh, novel, New York 2140. So, <clears throat> to start, I want to say that the novel describes a world where we are already living with the consequences of global warming. In the novel's universe, or world, we have various cataclysmic floods and surges in sea level rise that transform uh, the planet during the second half of the 21st century, so this century. By the, 19, by the 2140s, cities such as New York are adapting to this uh, new normal. For example, buildings are modified to withstand uh, the new sea level, people move around in boats rather than cars, and finance, as always, creates new indexes to evaluate and uh, profit from the real estate located in flooded areas. So alongside this general adap like capitalist adaptation, I would call it, there's, however, a horizontal logic of resistance going on in the plot. <coughs> Mutual aid societies are occupying or re rehabilitating old buildings abandoned by capital because they were considered at some point worthless because of their flooded status. So, in some, the novel has multiple storylines and they're all intertwined. In my view, they're all linked together by this uh, underlying plot about a creeping capitalist conspiracy to take over back what, it was, a, what, what was formerly abandoned as worthless. Basically, to take back what these proto socialist organizations uh, rescue and revitalize. revitalize. So that said, today uh, I want to reflect on the possible trajectory of late capitalism as it is discussed, I would say, represented in the novel. I, I think, in fact, that the novel provides an interesting mapping of the plausible future of financialization in the age of climate change. Uh, I will say that there's a deep contradiction that the novel addresses, which is this one, I would, uh, in my view, is that climate change will enhance the powers of finance, of financialization. On the other hand, financialization and climate change will coincide with the decline of capitalist power in general. So it's this uh, double movement, just to call it in some way, where climate change enhances the power of finance, but that goes on as capital in general is declining. That's why I think there's an underlying plot of the conspiracy to take back. So <clears throat> on the basis of the novel's argument about the future of capitalism, I argue that the rise of primitive accumulation strategies to finance, through finance, and for those who you are aware of the Marxist tradition will understand what primitive accumulation is, is a sign actually of capitalist decline. Uh, I think actually the data shows that the long run accumulation prospects of the capitalist world system, using in this case the US as, a, as the leading economy, are declining. So the system is engaging more and more on the type of practices that you see in the novel, which is taking rather than making, just to make it uh, briefly. So because of that, my thought will be mostly on how, on how the novel deals with financialization. If time permits, I will try to discuss how the combination of extreme weather events and financialization is already unfolding in some places. And lastly, what that means for leftist strategy. So to start, go to the slide. So, to start, I want to talk about, I think, two things that I think indicate the centrality of finance in the story. One, which I think is, uh, is in an, an ironic tone, is they use a neoclassical economics language to structure the chapters. To, to me, this is an, uh, an ironic key because the narrator, the narrator, or the narrative in general, is using that language, meaning the neoclassical language, while describing the disasters caused by neoclassical ideology in the first place. So you have chapters about the uh, tyranny of some cause, which is uh, figuratively and metaphorically talking about flooded areas. We have a liquidity trap, which is used by neoclassical economists to explain when like, an economy is in stagnation and uh, you need the moment of fiscal intervention. But in the novel it's used in a way, again, literally and figuratively to talk about flooded areas because there's liquidity there. So it's an ironic use. The other element that I think the novel uses to highlight the centrality of finance is the character of Franklin Gard, which to me is more symbolic. So this is, for example, in, uh, to me it's interesting that the, the Franklin is the only character who is contemporary to the novel events, who's actually a first person narrator. So while the other characters are like constrained by uh, larger forces, 
he gets to tell his own story. <coughs> and no, coincidentally, he's the main finance guy in the story. So I read that as a hint at finance uh, centrality in this, in this moment. So with this character, I think we have one good point of entry to, to talk about financialization. In my view, like, the question would be that, so what is Franklin doing that is different from other capitalists? I will show you a figure, but I will explain it. For, from a political economic perspective, Franklin is just trying, basically, to short circuit or bypass what Marx called the general formula of capital, which is a capital that has money, it borrows, inherited, whatever, invests the money <coughs> in the production of commodities and then sells the commodities to get the initial sum with profits. But there's one form of capital which Marx called interest-bearing capital, which tries to go from an initial amount of money to an end point that has more money by magically diverging or, let's say, bypassing the production process. Franklin is in that uh, field. And in the age of financialization, what is happening is that those guys are the dominant fraction of the capitalist class. Historically, the capitalists that had money invest in production, produce commodities, sell, get more money, were the dominant fraction. Now, it's the guys who coordinate the process. So what I try to explain with the graph, or the figure, my model is, a, is the model of uh, Franklin Gard's accumulation strategy, I would call it. He's in the top tier, in the blue line. He's going from money to money prime, meaning money plus profit. While he transfers, you know, guys in the second tier might take some of his money as investment and try to do the same thing. At some point, there's risky production. Some capitalists have to actually use money to buy commodities, to engage in production, to sell those commodities and make enough money to pay this guy, this guy, this guy, and then frankly at the top. So basically you can see the hierarchy in the capitalist class, right? And in the novel I think it treats very well. Franklin is very good at explaining what he's doing. So, <clears throat> and this is at heart the nature of financialization. financialization. The problem with this is that there's an underlying instability, which is if the guys are engaging in the production process, imagine this as different capitalists. Franklin is here, there's another guy here who takes some of the money, and there's a guy at the bottom who's also a capitalist, who's the one who has to have the factory, and who has to make enough of the primes, you cannot see it here, but it's three primes, because then two, then one, so money has to go up. Surplus value has to be produced. If these guys are not producing enough, at, at some point, the whole house of cards will. So that's like a structural uh, instability embedded in this process. So returning to the novel, what I, want, what I think it's representing is actually the plausible scenarios that follow from this structural instability, from the fact that the guys who are the dominant fraction of the capitalist class are the finance fraction. What happens when, for example, climate change is undermining the underlying conditions of production? Well, finance is increasingly like the cartoon in the, which at some point goes off the cliff, but it's just not noticing that there's no uh, floor anymore. So at some point, that contradiction will fall. So I think the novel, that's, that's, what, that's what the novel, I think, uh, combines in a great way. I think it's an achievement, the problem, with fi the problem of finance with the other great problem of climate change. Here I see the conversions with Jason's more, Jason Moore's uh, notion of a bad climate, meaning that climate change is increasingly making production more costly. This is something that's already been uh, researched, for example, in California, all the yields that are expected to happen, in declining yields in almonds, in all the uh, superfoods. Also, energy is becoming increasingly more expensive, even after the collapse of oil prices. If you see the long-term history of oil prices, they're going up meaning that the low prices of today are always higher than the higher prices of 20 or 40 years ago. So, <clears throat> what this, all of this means? Can we go to the graph of uh, the rate of profit? No. Yeah, so basically this is, this is a figure that I think condenses what I'm trying to say. This is the maximum rate of profit of the US economy. This is real data from San Luis Fed. Imagine this graph, don't uh, care about the numbers per se. It's just, this is the rate of profit capital would have in the US if workers were zero wages and there were zero taxes. This is meaning, this, the graph is just net national income over fixed capital. This is the maximum profitability. This is a, how you call it, um, I forget the word. 
uh, alternative scenario. I, I forget the word that I, that I wanted to say. It has been doing, going down historically, meaning the ceiling of top profitability is going down. Not necessarily actual profits, but the ceiling of maximum profit. And when that starts going down, meaning the system is increasingly less productive, they have to make up somehow. And finance, I think, is a great way for them to compensate because that's when they start taking what it has been built rather than producing new things. <coughs> Sorry. So, what I want to say at the end is this is, this is the meaning of the uh, conspiracy, if you read the novel, you will understand what I'm saying, to retake the buildings uh, rescued and rehabilitated by uh, community organizing, uh, horizontal uh, mutual aid associations, is to take what people build rather than engage in production. Why? Because the maximum profitability of the U.S. economy has been declining historically. So, to end, this leads me to a final point that I wanted to talk about, which is that some of the elements discussed in the story are already, I think, existing, so they can, seem, uh, can be seen as a metaphor for our actual existing present. And this might be a little bit like uh, <laughs> shocking, but I say... So, no, historical no, parallel notice between Puerto Rico in 2017 and between New York 2140. I read the novel in 2017 as the hurricane was happening, and there's an important hurricane in the novel, which triggers mass rebellion. In Puerto Rico, I, I, the, the hurricane did not trigger the kind of rebellion that you see in the novel, but it did trigger something important, which was the legitimacy of the left. Why? Because movements that have been for decades arguing in favor of solar power and agroecology came on top of the hurricane, after the hurricane. The, the, the fossil fuel energy system collapsed, but the solar power energy system, mainly led by left-wing uh, organizations, was intact. So they became saviors of a lot of people who complain about their hippie stuff for decades. And their agroecology uh, production also survived the hurricane way better than the large-scale plantation. So during the moment after the hurricane, those, uh, and you can read uh, Naomi Klein's uh, uh, short book, The Battle for Paradise, about that, there was a, two things happening at the same time. The government tried to implement deeper financialized strategies, the cryptocurrency farms, the bringing the, the what you call the Puerto Topians or the fi uh, foreign financiers, while at the same time the left leaning bottom up organizations were getting more and more legitimacy. So that, my point is that this kind of thing is already happening. Why this happened in Puerto Rico? Because Puerto Rico has been for decades undermined by a lot of transformations in the US economy. We only produce like 15% of the food that we eat. The economy has lost the manufacturing base. It's mostly a high tech, high finance, low jobs economy. So it's really resembling what will happen after climate, climate change it gets its worst effects. So in the end, however, in the, in, in the novel and in the crisis in Puerto Rico, the question of, of, of leftist strategy is an open question, right? There's, uh, this is what I think I interpret the last uh, point or message uh, from the novel, which is that leftists probably should embrace uh, deep social democratic reforms, such as universal health care, free college education, living wage, even when we know that there's steadily a state-led nature open some problems. It might have the possibility of, you know, going the, down the road of 20th century revolutions, concentrating power. Even knowing those risks, we should embrace those reforms. Why? Because we also can see them as opening on new possibilities for deeper reforms, for asking for more and more radical openings. And I think this is something that you can see in Puerto Rico, but you can also see in the U.S. And with that, 